Angels and welcome back to my channel and hello if you're new here my name is Mo I do video essays every now and then <laughs> I wish I had some big excuse but I just have ADHD and procrastination issues so let's crack this crispy diet coke and get into today's video shall we no free promo as you may have guessed by the title, today we are talking about euphoria, but most importantly, we are talking about cats. In this video, I'm going to be breaking down my thoughts and opinions on Kat, her costuming, and just the overall care that goes into crafting a modern day plus size character. Before I get into it though, I do want to say that I actually really enjoy Euphoria, and my critique of Kat is one of many I have with Vigel. <laughs> but like most things you love, you want to hold them to a higher standard. You also want Sam Levinson to have a writer's room. But that is neither here nor there. Let's get into our dissection of Kat. In the late 90s and 2000s, audiences were inundated with a wide variety of coming-of-age TV. During peak sitcom eras, teen viewers could sit back, relax, and watch their on-screen doppelgangers live out their wildest dreams. Except if you were fat. Not only was it rare to find a truly plus-size girl as part of the ensemble cast, it was basically non-existent to have her be the center of the story. Like seriously, sit here and think of one besides Raven Simone. Oh wait. One of the most common tactics casting directors would use to circumvent hiring girls above a size 16 is what we nowadays refer to as curve washing. In a recent article written by Natalie Mitchie for Fashion Magazine, curve washing is defined as the harmful marketing tactic that turns size diversity into a fantasy. And that pretty much hits the nail on the head. This type of cinematic gaslighting is something I touched on in my Duff video, but essentially it's putting a mid-sized girl or literally girl who wears a medium-sized t-shirt next to an extra small girl and they then use the storytelling and the script to exaggerate the body differences. Even now, I'm sure you can think of a TV or a movie that has done this to a character. So before we get into Cat, let's go back and visit some of Euphoria's distant relatives. Well, I'm not going to be touching on it too much in this video, the original Euphoria outsold in terms of plus-size storytelling. Amit Arez plays Noi Cohen, a depressed plus-size girl who begins to have casual hookups with men and eventually contracts HIV. There are definitely flaws in her character outside of the fact that Arez is clearly not plus-size, but the brutal way they attack her story feels almost refreshing. She falls victim to typical media tropes but isn't infantilized, minimized, or set to the side like some of our other Euphoria inspos. Tried to watch some of the original Euphoria, but it was grainy, definitely legal, definitely not using a VPN version, and the subtitles were minuscule. However, from what I could gather from watching and researching the show, it's a much more inclusive branch than our next family tree. Okay, let's take a drink for me in this one. Debuting on the English TV channel E4 during January of 2007, Skins UK quickly developed a cult-like following and critical acclaim. Although, like Euphoria, it was not without its detractors. Many claim the show was too dark for its teen demographic and offered up glamorized and romanticizations of loneliness, mental illness, and the likes. And when it came to diversity, Girl. And I know you're like, Mo, why are you talking about skins? There's no fat people. I'm only touching on it because it would be a miss to ignore the blatant similarities not only in storytelling, but the way the audiences consume and categorize the two shows. However, Skin sits atop a pile of Sofia Coppola movies and Joan Didion novels as a shining beacon of wafy white girl media. There is literally zero size diversity in Skins. Even though Cassie's storyline runs quite parallel to Kat's, the tendency to reduce all EDs down to thin white women suffering from anorexia is something we see repeated over and over until we're given the premiere of My Mad Fat Diary in 2013. Don't get me wrong, I know there are hundreds of thousands of thin women across the world who suffer from disordered eating, and I am supportive of them having realistic representation. But when does enough become too much? Because unfortunately, lack of representation in TV shows like Skins hinders society's ability to expand their mental image of what someone with disordered eating looks like. Skins 
was one of the most alienating forms of media I had ever consumed, in my humble opinion. That show changed the trajectory of my life and I feel like I'm entitled to a financial compensation. By the way, watch Misfits if you want some really great British teen media. Is it for teens? I don't know. Anyways, moving along. Grassy Next Generation debuted in 2001 as a reboot slash sequel show to the 1989 TV show Degrassi High, which was a sequel to the 1980s version Degrassi Junior High. I've said Degrassi so much, it's starting to sound like a fake word. Degrassi is essentially a show about teenagers at a small town Canadian high school and all the trials and tribulations they go through. Saying a theme here. One really interesting and I believe key reason that Degrassi does so much better at tackling size diversity has to do with how the show came to be. Created by Kit Hood and Linda Schuyler in 1979, the cast was picked from an acting company that consisted of non-professional, age-appropriate actors. It's said this was allegedly done to combat the American practice of casting young adults to play teenagers. Because its dedication to authenticity was ingrained in its creation, the Degrassi universe gets a leg up on the ability to push boundaries. Now, I tried to watch the various Degrassis to get a feel of what it was like back then and just to know the lore, but after eight hours of bouncing in between all of the shows, I felt like I was in some weird fever-induced multiverse of madness. So I'm going to be focusing on one main character, Terry. Hey. Most girls on the planet look like this, so get used to it. Although she is definitely what we would categorize as mid-sized today, seeing Christina Schmidt as Terry on Degrassi's Next Generation really did something for me as a young girl. In the same vein as Noi from the Israeli Euphoria, Terry's story is quite serious and one that a lot of us can unfortunately relate to. She deals with feeling uncomfortable with male attention, an abusive relationship, and actually becomes a plus-size model. Not only was it great to see something like that on TV, but the storyline is really well written because despite her success, she still becomes insecure about it and freaks out when she sees pictures of her plastered all over the town. Again, yes, yeah, she is flawed and set aside compared to other characters on Degrassi, but Christina Schmidt actually left the show in season three to pursue plus size modeling full time. It seems that allowing a person to share and put on their real life experiences was critical in Terry's development throughout the series. But we've all seen the alleged rumors floating around about friction on set between Barbie Fiera and creator writer Sam Levinson. I'm literally just theorizing here because I have zero tea, but I can only wonder if the lack of input on cast development in season two led to the inconsistencies we see in her story. Also knowing Drake is an executive producer on Euphoria and frequently sits in on table reads, I expected wheelchair Jimmy to understand complex teenage media since that's where he got his start and notice some of the gaps in Euphoria's writing, but of course, straight men, expectations often lead to disappointment. I honestly believe this very expectation is what led us to be so hyped up for Kat's character. When the cast was announced and it was made known that Barbie was going to be a main character, viewers walked into the premiere with the knowledge that, hey, we haven't yet had the plus size representation we deserve. They also walked in with the assumption that in 2019, surely we would finally shatter the glass ceiling of indie teen sleaze media and then we actually watched it. <laughs> when we first meet Kat, she's honestly quite modest, frequently wearing collared shirts and tailored trousers. She also has this adorable pair of circular glasses, which I hate that they got rid of. After her scandal, which do not worry, we are going to get into, her style develop into more of a defense mechanism. Heavily inspired by bondage fashion, Kat adorns herself in harnesses, collars, and bold dark colors. Not only is it a secret nod to the double life she lives, but the straps crisscross around her body like a web of protection. Kat's season one style is okay. It's very Forever 21 clearance rack. But I mainly want to focus on season two because that's where my main issue is. In an interview with Vogue India, a costume stylist Heidi Bivens and Angela Vito spoke about the inspiration behind Kat's season two style. In season two, we want Kat to feel sexy but cool. She did boot like cramp shirts, a cardigan to style her school looks. Definitely drawing inspiration from 90s Drew Barrymore, says Vito. I definitely do see the 90s inspiration and I do really enjoy Kat's style, but once I broke down the outfits and focused on the individual pieces, I realized how inaccessible Kat's style is. Like, 
I can't. This adorable outfit that I love, Barbie is wearing a bootleg cramp shirt, which to be fair, vintage t-shirts are tiny and super expensive, so I'm not surprised a high schooler would have like an AliExpress version or something like that. However, she's wearing an Almighty skirt and a Guizio cardigan, which is confusing because Almighty only goes up to a size large and you guessed it. The Guizio cardigan only goes up to a size large. There's also a scene during Lexi's play that Kat is wearing a Vivian Westwood portrait corset. And do I even have to say it? Do I even have to? I do. Obviously it's not plus size. And if it is, it's most likely a custom. And therein lies the issue. It's extremely disappointing to once again have our plus size representation wear pieces that are inaccessible to the audience they're meant to represent. The point is not the money because plus size buyers actually have over $3.1 billion in buying power. It's just extremely disappointing to once again have our plus size representation where pieces that are inaccessible to the audience they're meant to represent. In season three, I'd like to see Kat wear outfits by smaller indie designers and those who actually put time and effort into creating beautiful plus size garments. Yes, it's nice to focus on small designers who offer custom sizing, but working with a brand who takes the time and money to develop plus size patterns is essential for the viewer. Euphoria is arguably one of the biggest influences of our generation and pieces worn by each character frequently sell out in spite of their astronomical price tag. So the exposure from the show and subsequent monetary gain would allow brands to expand their reach and elevate a new voice within the plus size fashion industry. But again, this is going to require intentional inclusivity. And like the traffic in LA, the entertainment industry is always looking for a shortcut. I'm not gonna touch on this too much because Barbie Fiera is a real person, but I also feel like it's important to speak candidly on this topic. Not only did they take the easy way out by casting a plus size character who falls on the mid-size spectrum, they cast somebody who is already a curved model and who walks through the world with the consciousness that they are a model. Does that make any, does that make any sense? What I mean by that is normal, everyday plus size girls matter. Skinny actresses don't have to be toned, shapely, muscular. They simply have to be thin. However, plus size characters have to have smooth stomachs and backs with no rolls, shapely hips and thighs with minor cellulite. And I'm just sad that our representation continues to be the prettiest and smallest plus size girl that we could find. Don't get me wrong, I am happy that we have a voice in the room, but a token plus size character is not only harmful to the audience watching, but to the actors who play them as well. In a video for Euphoria season two promo, Barbie spoke about her real life insecurities and the pressure she feels having to be confident as the only plus size girl on the show. I have this expectation to be this confident person, which I have to say, I'm not very confident at all. There's this false perspective on me that just because I'm a bigger person in a world of thinner people, I must be confident. What this really boils down to for Barbie and the viewers is the need for more visibly fat people on television. There is nothing different between somebody my size and a person Barbie's size, except for the way our bodies are perceived. We can't ignore that there is privilege in the fat community, and by having her not only be the only fat person in the high school, like, seriously, where are the big girls at? Even the extras, I don't see them. The only fat main character, it just falls flat and still perpetuates a harmful body standard for young girls. I feel like plus size characters are the Brandy Melville of TV. It's like one size must fit all or you will not get hired. And that's really sad to see. This one is gonna be a tricky one to talk about because YouTube hates almost every word I need to say in this section, but it is necessary. So if I use code words or abbreviations, then you guys know what I'm trying to say. So to me, to me, I believe that Kat's V-car scene is already dubious consent. And then as soon as you film somebody without their permission, it turns into essay. Okay, so watching it, I did feel pretty uncomfortable and the vibe is very clear that she doesn't enjoy the situation despite the weird way it's portrayed and the way they followed it up with her transformation into Kitty fell so flat for me. Obviously, Helen Keller could see that Kat's new wardrobe was a defense mechanism to ignore what she really went through, but I'm just like, why? Why? A show like Euphoria, that refuses to cover its eyes to the reality of human suffering, what I thought would have been a really powerful 
and realistic version of events following the scene, Kat realized that being filmed is SA and she is a victim. And I'm not gonna lie, I really hate how it's reduced and minimized to like a noodles leaking scandal, especially considering how often plus size people are the victims of SA. 67% of women in the United States are above a size 14 and one in six women have experienced SA in their lifetime. The numbers are clear, it's past time that we had a realistic portrayal of a plus size victim. Instead of taking the time to flesh out a story where Kat is taken advantage of and what the real life fallout of that would have been, they slam dunk her into the realization that hyper sexualization and rewriting the narrative is the only way to regain her power. And like I said, I just don't agree with that creative decision. I think a more accurate and realistic approach could have been for Kat to express that she was essayed by the boys and have no one believe her. I think taking the route of people at her school and her authorities not believing her and exploring these extremely problematic ideas around plus size victims that are perpetuated by preophobia. Like, she's lucky for the attention or you're lucky someone slept with the fat girl. This would have allowed a peek into a situation a lot of plus size women deal with when it comes to reporting essay in the real world because weight bias heavily impacts our view on victims. In a 2013 study by Rachel Howe and Dr. Niowako Yamawaki at Brigham Young University, they examined the weight-based discrimination of our victims. The participants were given a scenario where a woman, Janet, claimed to be Ard and a man, Mark, claimed it was consensual. However, in some scenarios, Mark would be displayed as plus size while Janet would be portrayed as thin. And then the inverse, Janet would be plus size and Mark would be thin. They were also given scenarios in which both of them are plus size and both of them are thin. The study found that although men, of course, were more inclined to believe Mark when Janet was plus size, Participants of both genders ranked Mark's credibility significantly higher when he was the thin one in the scenario, highlighting how internalized misogyny affects how our female peers view us as well. Unfortunately, these types of beliefs also translate from studies into real life. In 2017, Judge Jean-Paul Braun of Quebec, Canada came under fire for this very thing. Proceeding over the case involving the essay of a 17-year-old girl at the hands of a 49-year-old cab driver, Carl Figaro, he had this to say. It can be said that she is a little overweight, but she has a pretty face. He also suggested that the victim should have been flattered because this was the first time a man had shown interest in her. Just disgusting and vile type of thinking, which is insidious in our culture. And that's why I wish Euphoria would have used this instance to take a stand seeing how large their platform is. But again, it seems like the writers thought her taking her power back by putting on an FU attitude was more realistic. And while some may argue it is because of course, I'm not gonna sit here and ignore or minimize the hyper sexuality that is often born from trauma, I think allowing plus size girls to see themselves represented as victims who are advocated for and strong in their stance of, no, this happened to me, it was wrong and I won't hide from it, is a much better option. Imagine she spent the entire season advocating for herself, trying to prove she was a victim, and it did happen, all while facing this type of criticism and people calling her a liar. Then, at the end of the season, the video is leaked and it's proof of her essay. It's extremely dark and problematic, as are most Euphoria storylines, but the leaking of the video vindicating her while also being a double-edged sword allows the show to tackle the re-victimization that frequently comes along with receiving justice. If that would have happened, I feel like her transformation into Kitty and working as an SW playing out in season two would have been a much more realistic trajectory for Kat's path of trauma. Puts on new outfits, switches up her makeup, and ditches her glasses. For all of this, she kills the version of herself that was in that situation and is reborn as Kitty. I feel like looking at this scene and this season, Less of one is where she turns into like a bad bee, and more is her putting on an armor of emotional defense helps show the situation for what it really is. Kat is essentially saying, if they're going to stare, I'll give them something to stare at, thus starting her victim to villain character arc. Kat is actually a really good friend and tries to do her best. So this villain section is mainly to do with Eastman and Kat's relationship because I think it tells us a lot about the care that goes into writing Kat and other plus size characters like her. 
In an interview with Insider in March of this year, Barbie had this to say about Kat and Ethan's relationship trajectory. I definitely knew that the Ethan thing wasn't going to last. In true euphoria fashion, Ferrer said, being happily in love, I don't think was very much in the cards for Kat because she had just started the journey of kind of understanding what she wants and who she is. She really went off the deep end when she started falling more and more into her internet alter ego, the star said, referencing season one. So I definitely knew the Ethan and Kat relationship was going to go downhill. While I don't agree with the reason why, I do actually agree their relationship wasn't going to last. I mean, it is euphoria after all. Once again, the execution demolishes any potential impact. Kat is a survivor of SA, worked as a camera model, on top of dealing with regular teenage things like body image issues and disordered eating. There were so many other avenues the show could have explored to lead us to the end of their relationship. We saw Kat act out of immaturity and insecurity in season one during the carnival episode, and although Ethan's adorable promise unfortunately came true, I think the terminal brain illness storyline, to be like completely blunt, was not only disrespectful to the actors, the character cat itself, but specifically to the young girls in the audience who finally saw a plus size character being loved by somebody with pure intentions. Now watch Ethan turn out to be black screen and this whole part ages like milk. <laughs> but to watch their love progress and have it cut short by something so silly is just another example of the lack of care given to plus size character stories. There are so many ways that weight and trauma affect interpersonal relationships and to just have this entire catalog of ideas that would hold up a mirror to the young girls who are watching and partake in some of this self-sabotaging and harmful behavior. They just choose to have her look like the fat funny friend failing to use humor to end a relationship she feels smothered in. I don't know if I would have disliked the diner scene as much as I did if we would have had more scenes about the downfall of the relationship. We see glimpses of annoyance and panic from Cap, but it's truly out of the blue for Ethan and the audience when she ends things. Outside of the scene where she is being shouted at by influencers, which I do think is a really good um, representation about the immense pressure we put on plus size women to like love themselves as they are. I think her tendency is to escape into delusions and find comfort in alternative realities is ultimately what led to the downfall of her and Ethan's relationship. But again, that's simply guessing because the audience wasn't shown that. There are ways to highlight introspective dialogue and to take the character on a journey although they may be experiencing self-isolation. Instead, Kat is essentially cut from the show and the viewers are left to fill the gaps with the idea that she's probably just off reading Larry's style and some fanfic. All of this to say, if any one thing that happened to Kat happened to Cassie, Maddie, or Rue, the delicate attention it would have been paid would have been worthy of an Emmy. Yet, Kat stands against the brick house of Euphoria's story like cinematic scaffolding. The audience is giving clips of her fantasies, blips of her worst nightmares, and echoes of her past trauma. Never manifesting as a whole person, but always just enough to fill a quota.